Good evening. This is Felicity. I'm speaking to you from our library behind a wall of books. This is a wall of books that is everything that I have in my library by Umberto Eco, and there's a lot. So I thought I would show you my, my fortress of echoes first. <laughs> and then I'm, I'm going to display their charms because I'm very proud of this because he's my favorite author. I mean, I could say he's one of my favorite authors, but who would I be kidding? I have everything I could find by Umberto Eco, whether I was able to read it or not. So I shall push these all aside and then let's have some fun with that. Okay, a lot of echo. There's the echo, the echo answer. It used to be an old silly joke. Who are they who paid two guineas to hear a tune of Paganini's? And the echo answered Paganini's. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, dad jokes. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> move them all aside. Move my camera. And start the fun. Okay. <laughs> there we go. There's me. The library behind me. All right, so yeah, Umberto Eco is a most, most erudite, most um, uh, literary, most um, most intelligent, um, probably the best read person I've ever heard of. He has a library which I can only dream of and aspire to. It is the library I, whenever I'm having one of those one of those days, I I go back and I look at the video of Umberto Eco walking to his library, and this makes everything better. So there you go. Anyway, Umberto in my library looks like this. I'm just going to go through them one by one. And then um, they're not in any particular order except how they came off the shelves, which are sorted by size. <laughs> All right. So the basic areas that Umberto Eco wrote in were mostly nonfiction. Um, with a very, uh, with a very impressive selection of fiction, which he started writing as an older, an older writer, um, and his nonfiction is um, theory, the theory of semiotics, and there's a few books on that, um, and um, essays, which were part of the um, La Bustina di Minerva, which was a column that he wrote um, in Italy and Italian, obviously, for decades, and many of them got collected into the best of. Um, and maybe someday there'll be a whole um, entire collection of them, but I have a lot of those essays represented here in my library. Starting with Roberto Echo's Turning Back the Clock, Hot Wars and Media Populism. So these are, again, these are essays, and uh, they, they range, as do all of the books of essays, um, over his entire range of interests, mostly, um, mostly, um, in this case, political, but there's 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 a bunch of things in here. There's a whole bunch of essays, uh, reflections on war and peace, science, technology, and magic, uh, for whom the bell tolls, chronicles of the late empire, kamikazes and assassins, the twilight of the new millennium. So there's there you go. And I'm not going to spend too much time talking. I'll be here all night because I have 34 books by Umberto Eco in my library. There you go. Turning back the clock. So that's one of his essays, uh, books of essays. Um, the next one, the stack, is the other extreme, a theory of semiotics. I only understand but uh, one in every five words, and um, maybe one of these days it'll make sense to me. But this is what he was about: theory of semiotics. It's not his. I mean, he didn't invent it, um, but he definitely pursued it as a um, as a pers as, as a, a scholarly pursuit, and that was what he taught in Milan. That was his uh, that was his field of endeavor. Um, all the rest of it was icing on the cake. But oh my goodness, what what icing! Let me give you an example. I shall try and give a few examples. When Australopithecines used a stone to split the skull of a baboon, there was as yet no culture, even if an Australopithecine had in fact transformed an element of nature into a tool. We would say that culture is born when, one, a thinking being establishes the new function of the stone, irrespective of whether he works on it, transforming it into a flintstone. Two, he calls it a stone that serves for something, irrespective of whether he calls it so to others or out loud. Three, he recognizes it as the stone that responds to the function F and that it has the name Y, irrespective of whether he uses it as such a second time. It is sufficient that he recognizes it. Well, that's a sample. Theory of semiotics. Maybe someday, huh? But I have it because if I see a book by Umberto Eco that I don't have yet, I just buy it. All right, here's another collection of essays I have of his, um, Inventing the Enemy. 
Um, this was um, so. This was so each one of these. I got I got it whenever I saw it. Uh, but these essays, for example, um, "Invent of the Enemy" is the title is the title of the book and also the title essay. "Invent of the Enemy," absolute and relative. The beauty of the flame, treasure hunting, fermented delights, no embryos in paradise. Who love these titles? These are fabulous. Hugo Hella, the poetics of excess. Ulysses. That's all we needed. There you go. Another book of essays. Inventing the enemy. Maybe I'll have an essay by Umberto Eco we do one of these days. Okay, and here we have, so this is um, Umberto Eco on literature, where he, this is the one I think where I was reading about Sylvie and realized, nope, I think this one is another one. So these are essays on literature and uh, a reading of the Paradiso, a Paradiso, style of Communist Manifesto, the myths of the Valois. remember which one it was. Maybe that was it. Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of those. I've read many and then I go back and I read them again and I say, did I really read that? Uh, Borges and my anxiety of influence. Le Semaphore sous la pluie. He was reasonably fluent in English, German, French. Um, so of course is his native Italian and I don't think he actually published anything in English. They were all translated. For example this one was translated by a lot of them were translated by Weaver, but I suppose they all vary somewhat. Uh, this was actually McLaughlin, so a bunch of guys. So another book of another collection. This was only essays on literature by Umberto Eco. Yes. Okay, and this one I just showed off in my last video, which was an infinity of lists, and it is, of course, called The Infinity of Lists, and it is a treat. Uh, it's really heavy because the pages are, oh yes, they're just beautiful, they're in color, and they're beautifully printed, and the pages weigh something because it's not just the size of the book, it's not that much bigger, but the paper is highly, highly superior, and yeah, you know, if you get tired of reading the words, or they're there. They're gentle, they're interspersed, there's not tons and tons of words, but there are short tons of pictures. They're all great. I think I saw this, uh, I'm going to say that I saw this first at um, um, UC Berkeley Library where I was looking for other things, and I, I said, you know, I'm, I'm just not checking this out because I'm going to buy it. You know I am. There you go. So this is the um, Infinity of Lists, and whenever I get tired of being serious, when I get tired of reading things, things that tax my brain, I just open up this book and it is full of beautiful pictures and interesting lists. And we all know about Felicity and lists now, don't we? Right? The infinity of lists. Oh my. Uh, all right, here's another book of essays by Umberto Eco. This is Apocalypse Postponed. Uh, and these are. These guys here were um, mass culture mass media and limits of communication. These are a uh, chapter, these are like categories of the essays. Part three is the rise and fall of counterculture. Now was this essays, you know, this actually might not have been. This is actually a, a through composed book. I do not think these were, I do not think these were, were perhaps, uh, were perhaps essays. I'm not sure. Independent radio in Italy, a dollar for a deputy, for grace received, the Italian genius industry, so I'm going to, to read this again because now I'm not remembering. Um, well, there you go. That's what happens when I go through my library. I find things that I don't even remember anymore. But I've had I've had some of these for a really long time because I've been I've been a, a huge fan of Umberto Eco since we see because they're mostly at the back. Uh, since the name of the rose, there you go. which I obtained in a paperback, which is a small mass market paperback that's long since died and left my library. And yes, so I've got a different one now. All right, now here's another one. This is not this is not essays. This is another textbook. The role of the reader, explorations in the semiotics of texts. And um, I did actually try reading this one. I did kind of have to take a break from it because it's ah, aesthetic messages in an Edenic language and where we're, we start off like, oh, hey, I can read this. Adam and Eve have only just settled down in the Garden of Eden. They have learned to find their way around with the help of language. 
when out comes God, who pronounces the first factual judgment. The general sense of what God is trying to tell them is as follows. You two probably imagine that the apple belongs to the class of good edible things because it happens to be red. Well, I've got news for you. The apple is not to be considered edible because it is bad. And we, uh, we go on down and we get more and more mathematical until we get to God spoke and his words were slash B-A-A-A-B period B-A-B score B-A-A-A-B period B-A-A-B slash apple inedible apple bad. Okay. Anyway, so this is one of the uh, one of the works of Umberto Eco because I am a completist when it comes to him. There's there's still a few I don't have that I am looking for when I have uh, yeah funds to buy again. I'll be looking for the other two children's books I don't have. Explorations in the semiotics of texts. Um, two more pretty pretties here. So this is on ugliness, edited by Umberto Eco. So this one is. Um, this is again, this is collections of things from um, various. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, hey, listen, I'm a completist. I don't know if I really. Okay, well, some of you are going to really dig this, but some of it is just really, really, really gory. But... Oh my God. Uh. Okay. The Ugliness of the Byzantines. This is Le Renaissance and Liberation. <laughs> Yeah. Ooh, Gustave Dore's illustration for Gargantuan Pantagruel. Yes. So the category says, let's see what's, what's, oh my goodness, yes, they've forgotten how very, very ugly some of these were. Well, ugliness is in the eye of the beholder, right? Ugliness in the classical world, passion, death, and martyrdom. I think he wrote, he wrote the little snippets before, but he has a lot of excerpts from um, authors, and obviously from artists. Um, the ugliness of women from antiquity to the Baroque period. Ugly, the comic, and the obscene. So there you go. And it's matching. Its companion piece is, of course, The History of Beauty, edited by Umberto Eco. Another really, really handsome picture book where it's a little bit easier on the eyeballs because, yeah, well, these are all things that we consider beautiful. And since I am part of, uh, I am a product of Western culture and tradition, and Umberto Eco is uh, looking at beauty um, as in the eye of the Western tradition beholder. It's beautiful to me, too. Um, right, so uh, a cor uh, not a corifon, a, um, um, a uh, telemon? No, that was the corifon. Um, and then there's, oh, yeah, there's a timeline like that. So this is actually really, this is a gorgeous book. Gorgeous. Actually, so is on ugliness. It's just, it's a little hard to see. So. Um, and then he does have, he does have um, uh, textual snippets from various different authors, much as he did in, on ugliness, and also in the Infinity of Lists um, on, on beauty. There you go. So now this is one of three children's books that he wrote, The Gnomes of New, or The Gnomes of Gnu. Uh, this is. It's actually, it's really good, and it is for children, and it has, um, the premise is, is that there's this explorers from this king who wants to, uh, who wants to discover some new lands and, and, and own them, uh, and he, they discover this planet, this was the planet on um, the gnomes of Gnu, and um, the uh, prime minister is, the, 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 the spokesman is trying to convince them, uh, the, the gnomes, the gnomes of Gnu, um, that they need to be uh, they need to be discovered by his co country on his planet because uh, because of all the great things they did and of course they were doing things like uh, they, they, the gnomes ask things like what are hospitals for people who are sick well why do they get sick and they go through all that and the gnome says you know what actually I don't you know we don't we don't really need any of that because we're not <laughs> we're not having a problem with sickness because we don't take any of those things we call drugs and whatnot so. Um, yeah, this is actually great. The other two are the bomb and the general, or this general and the bomb, I forget, and, uh, and, a, and a, another one, and I have not actually been able to see them, which probably means they're ridiculously expensive. All right, so, stuck. Okay, so, oh, oh my goodness, I have so many books by Umberto Echo. So here's one, a pretty picture. We know this, this is actually, a, um, this is a painting by um, Remedios Varro. 
which is used as the cover of this, which is pretty gorgeous. Um, there's experiences in translation. And um, it's a little, little blurb on the back. It's just from the introduction. Active or passive experience in translations is not irrelevant for the formulation of theoretical reflections on the subject. In my lectures, therefore, my primary aim is to consider certain problems that I have tried to solve, not as a translation theorist or as a semiotician interested in translation, but as a translated author and as a translator. So this is, uh, this is him talking about um, translating. And it is it's interesting. Again, it's a little bit of it's a slim, cute little book. Still, and there's still a lot of reading to be done in there. Right. So this is a nonfiction. Again, yeah, this one, the open work. The open work. Um, uh, this is this is another um, book of theory. It is not. Um, this is it's a theory. Uh, theories of aesthetics. Um, it says here, he explores a set of issues in aesthetics that remain central to critical theory and does so in a characteristically vivid style. Vivid <laughs> and really erudite. Sorry. Um, but it is, um, it is one which is on my completest stack, but it is definitely one that I need to actually try again and read. If I don't have it, I can't try it, can I? There's another set of um, studies. This is... Um, from the Tree to the Labyrinth. This is one of the very last things that I got. Um, it is, let's say, summa of one of, this is from the Tree to the Labyrinth, is a sort of summa of one of our most important thinkers on matters of language, signification, and interpretation. So I haven't read this one yet. I didn't get it that long ago. Um, even though I got it slightly, I think it, was, it, it came out somewhat after Umberto Eco died. Um, and uh, it is, it is, I have not read it yet. It is um, not essays for the paper that he was writing for. Um, it is not, uh, I don't think it's on, is it some of it, so I think it's going to be on this and that. Again, I haven't read it yet, but I don't think it's excerpts from any of the other works. It's, these are, um, these are, these are uh, long essays. These are long essays, not articles. For example, from metaphor to analogia entus, um, fakes and forgeries in the Middle Ages, Dante between Modestai and Kabbalah, towards a history of denotation on Lul Pico and Lulism. Here we stuff. So there's that. Okay, and another another one of his not essays, but of theory books, semiotics and the philosophy of language. Nope, I haven't really kind of gotten into this one either. But I have it. Um, okay, now here's something we're all going to recognize. They're in the stack because they are huge. Here we go. So, Foucault's Pendulum. This is, a, this is the second one of his I think I read, and um, I'm not going to go too far into this one because this is actually a really important book to me. I've read it two or three times. Um, get set for another read, probably. I've got a few things to read in July, which are <laughs> I mentioned before in a video. Um, but this is actually uh, pulling from a lot of his really interesting research that he did on cults and um, groups and secret societies. And it is, it's funny, it's uh, literate, it's kind of creepy in a way. Okay, it's creepy in a lot of ways because um, these guys... The premise is that these two guys, they, they, they're trying to come up with a scheme to actually uh, produce a book that's just absolutely, uh, not a fake, but that's clearly and obviously um, a parody. So they come up with, uh, they come up with a source book of, um, of a cult that doesn't exist, that never did. And um, it backfires in the end on them because um, somebody was taking it seriously. It's a pretty crazy book, but it is amazing. And you have to stay on your toes when you're reading it because every single chapter pulls in some sometimes sly little side reference, sometimes a really big thing on, okay, a Rosicrucians and um, um, uh, I'm blanking right now. Um, 
the Templars, uh, what happened to the Templars. Um, yeah. oh, it kind of starts at the end. At the beginning, it starts at the end, and at the end, it ends. <laughs> anyway, so this is um, this is scheduled for a reread um, there. I think I've read once. This was one that I acquired fairly late when I was going through an, a wholesale echo acquisition. This is the Prague Cemetery, and um, I, I'm thinking that if I did read it, it was a while ago, and I need to read it again. I have not read that one as much as Foucault. Now here goes um, The Mysterious Flame of Queen Luana, which I had slated to finish my reread in uh, July, and it's done, and it was great. I'm not going to say too much about it because some of you might not have actually read it yet, in which case, can I assure you that if you like Compared to Echo, you're going to really like this book. <laughs> there you go, The Mysterious Flame of Queen Loana, and the, the main premise is that there's a, it opens with a, a, um, a dealer in antique books, in very fine high-end antique books, who wakes up in the hospital and he can't remember anything about his regular life, about his wife, his children, his grandchildren, the uh, alluring young lady who works for him um, um, as an uh, amanuensis in his business, his friends, any of them. But he can not remember every book that he's read, but every time something comes up where somebody says, how about this or that, then he immediately comes up with a quote from a book that he's read and he remembers it perfectly the quote from the book. It's pretty cool. I, really enjoyed that. I, I enjoyed my reread of that one. Okay, this one was, uh, this was a gift. A very fine one too, because this one I think is signed. I want to say no, maybe it's not signed. Oh no, oh no, I thought I had a signed one of this one. Oh well, c'est la vie. It's too late now, right? So this is, um, this is Baudolino, and it did probably because the name of the rose is so incredibly popular. This one didn't get quite as much good press as um, some of his other ones, but I thought Badalino was great. This is actually the premises Hunting for Prester John. Wow. Badalino is a self-professed liar, um, but he ends up being the hero of the story. I really enjoyed this. This is also scheduled for a reread, but not right away because, oh, I have one or two other things to finish. Um... Island of the Day Before was 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 pretty weird. It was uh, this was not what I was expecting when I started reading it. I'm glad I did because it's uh, it's kind of interesting, like a sort of an anti anti Robinson Crusoe. Um, guy gets stranded, can't swim, won't go to shore, can't do anything, but he has all these books. <laughs> it was pretty good. It was uh, yeah, Bertrico. So one more of his his uh, novels. Of course, I have the name of the Rose, but it's buried in another stack there because those are smaller sized. All right, so then the Book of Legendary Lands, Umberto Echo. This is a Rizzoli, so of course you know it's going to be a gorgeous picture book. And um, I have two or three books of, I have Manguel's um, uh, book, of, book of Imaginary Lands, and this is, this is Umberto Echo's, uh, and it is, it is, um, gorgeously illustrated and it is it's just it's a wonderful layout which is not really surprising because it's a Rizzoli publication uh, again heavy because the paper is really really high quality so this is another uh, it's a little bit more uh, text in this than there is on the infinity of lists but this is a um, this is a book that I don't mind sitting in a corner with a glass of something <laughs> and uh, and just just relishing it Book of Legendary Lands by Umberto Eco. All right, so this is the last in this little stack here. I did read this one. This is Echo and Jean-Claude Carrier. I think this was also supposed to be an interview, which I didn't I didn't watch it or listen to it because I I seem to find a lot of trouble finding time for anything other than reading. Oh, and yeah, making booktube videos and watching all of my booktube colleagues with their wonderful videos. Anyway. <laughs> This is not, however, the end of the book. And it's a very interesting dialogue between Roberto Eco and uh, Jean-Claude Carrier. And um, they're talking about what is the history of the book? Is it going to die? And uh, the both of them said, uh, no. Different, the, 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 the chapter titles look something like this. Books with a will to survive. 
it took chickens almost a century to learn not to cross the road. It's actually pretty fun reading. In praise of stupidity, the internet or the impossibility of damnatio memoriae. Fire is censor. All the books we haven't read. Books on the altar and books in hell. And lastly, what will happen to your book collections when you die? Indeed. This one's, a, this one's a great read. This is not the end of the book by any means. All right, and there's my other stack here. There's stack number whatever. <laughs> okay, Chronicles of a Liquid Society came out. Um, just a collection again, a collection of essays. Wasn't included in any of the other sets that I have, but it was definitely these were. This was published after his, um, uh, shortly after he died. And uh, these are... Um, these are, I think this, there may have been a collection of essays he was getting set to publish because the introduction is by himself, but he wrote, he wrote the introduction. It's, it's a short, sweet, wonderful little thing. Um, forward to that. Um, and here's where I found out what, where all these essays came from. I shall read it. It is short. I began writing a regular column called La Bustina di Minerva for the Italian weekly magazine L'Espresso in 1985 first every week, then every other week. Its title referred to a brand of matchbook that had two white spaces inside that were useful for brief jottings, and so I intended my articles to be short notes and digressions on ideas that came to mind. They were generally inspired by topical events, but not always, since I regarded it as topical that one evening I had decided maybe to reread the page, a page of Herodotus, a Grimm's fairy tale, or a Popeye comic. A number of earlier articles appeared in How to Travel with the Salmon, <laughs> oh yeah, and um, other essays, I guess it did, and others written before 2000 were published in Turning Back the Clock, Hot Wars, and Media Populism. But between 2000 and 2015, I had written more than 400 articles, roughly, roughly 26 a year, felt that some of these could be salvaged. Well, maybe somebody will salvage all of them, eh? I wouldn't say no to that. I think most of the Bustina di Minerva pieces collected in this book can be seen as reflections on aspects of this liquid society of ours, about which I wrote in a more recent article placed here at the beginning of the book. Though many repetitions have been cut, some remain since several topics came up with worrying regularity over those 15 years, causing me to return and dwell on certain themes that were still disturbingly relevant. I got it. Yeah, um, the repeats that I remember, um, there were a <laughs> copy from the internet. Um, yeah, on cell phones. More thoughts on the cell phone. Yeah, I think actually I did read that on swallowing the cell phone. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I'd forgotten. So there's actually a lot of goodness in here. And so if there are repeats, I already care. As long as there was, a, there was a few that I hadn't read. There was a few that I hadn't read. It's very important. And you know what? The more I collect things, for example, I've got a lot of collections of uh, Dunsany's um, short stories, and um, I, I've kept all the books because each one of them, there's one story maybe in one of the books that's repeated in many of the others, and maybe a couple of them have a lot of repeated stories, but each one of them has something a little different. And because I really like Dunsany, I've got all the books I could find. All right, so here goes another, um, another, um, set of, okay, this is not essays from Bustina or anything like that. This is interpretation and over-interpretation. Um, so with Richard Rorty, I don't believe I've actually read this one because this, com again, comes into the category of, I don't think, actually, I probably should because this is, this is actually a literary one. This is not, this is not so semiotic, which is really, really not something that's like, that goes right over my head. Um, Umberto Eco, international bestseller novelist, of course, yeah, whatever, and leading literary theorist, here brings together these two roles in a provocative discussion of the vexed question of literary interpretation. The limits of interpretation, what a text can actually be said to mean, are of double interest to a semiotician whose own novel's intriguing, intriguing complexity has provoked his readers into intense speculation as to their meaning. Echo's illuminating and frequently hilarious discussion ranges from Dante to The Name of the Rose, from Foucault's Pendrun to Chomsky and Derrida, and bears all the hallmarks of his inimitable personal style. 
three of the world's leading figures in philosophy, literary theory, and criticism take up the challenge of entering into debate with Echo on the question of interpretation. Maybe I should read, I should read this one, because I might have dipped in, but apparently not, because I don't remember that at all. Go, this was a delight. I purchased this a couple of, oh, actually this is just before, yes, the COVID shut down in 2020, and I bought this as a present for myself on Christmas of 20, of 2019. And I believe I started reading this um, yeah, in uh, mid-March when um, the shop where I work was closed for two and a half months. Confessions of a Young Novelist is a delight. It is absolutely wonderful. He talks about his own progression into writing novels. And uh, the young is relative because he was midway through his life when he started writing novels. How bad is that? I love this one. This one was this one was really beautiful, and this was really, really wonderfully written. Confessions of a Young Novelist. All right. His readings, essays again from um, yeah, Bustina. Um, this is uh, these are great. Industry and sexual repression in a Po Valley society. <laughs> the latest from heaven. I'm going to be reading this one in just a second. Actually, I think I did, but I think it's up for a reread. This readings great stuff. Okay, this one was a classic, How to Write a Thesis. And I think he added a couple of things in the end for like writing a thesis in the days of the internet. But this is, as you can see from the font, was written when you did your research in a library by looking at the books. And to find a book that was not in the library, you had to write to other libraries. And you had to type your thesis on a typewriter. Witness the evidence in the front there. So how to write a thesis. It's quite instructional, even for somebody like me that has absolutely no plans to do any such thing. It talks about how do you do proper research? How do you do improper research? How do you figure what is going to be the subject of your thesis? And many other very enlightening um, things that even for somebody that just wants to be maybe a little bit more coherent of a writer, this isn't so bad. I really like the section on how do you do proper research? Well, he was using, he was using index cards, but well, there you go. You can apply the same techniques to some kind of um, uh, computer database. Probably, maybe be better off writing it on cards. I don't know. Not being a thesis writer, I really couldn't say. But I have uh, some skinny little guys here. Uh, and yeah, these are all next back here. So five moral pieces. And these are, um, these are not, these are kind of, they're, 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 they're little essays. They, uh, where do they come from? They might have been, they may, they might have originally been from, uh, Augustina, who knows? They are, um, they are essays and they discuss a variety of different things. So, um, five moral pieces, well, I guess they are moral reflections on war. When the other appears on the scene, on the press, or fascism. Migration, Tolerance, and the Intolerable. I think I read this a really long time ago. Ready for a reread. Always ready for a reread. Here you go. Um, mouse or Rat? Translation is negotiation. If translation can be funny, it is because the subject is in essence all about mistranslation and the terrible knots we get into when traveling between languages. An entertaining fluid tour around the problem that arises from the awkward fit between the world's languages, Alain de Poton, the Times, from the Times. Uh, actually, at this time when I got this, I had never even heard of Alain de Botton, where I have now, and I've got two or three of his that I've read that are that are really great. Um, so, yeah, um, one of the world's most brilliant, blah, 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 entertaining writers on literature and language. In this accessible and dazzling study, he turns his eye on the subject of translations and the problems that differences between cultures can cause. Fired by Echo's immense wit and erudition, this is an intriguing read that explores why a rat is sometimes a mouse, bachelors are a problem, and where you can find the plants of Shakespeare. Right, running out of form on my stack there. Travels on hyperreality. Again, um, essays on a uh, really huge number of uh, um, um, areas. So he, uh, again, these are, these are, these are essays, Travels in Hyperreality, Return of the Middle Ages. Uh, these are sub subtitles, the fashion, the sacred is not just a fashion, suicides of the temple, whose side are the Orica on? Why are they laughing in those cages? These are selected titles. His essays are great. 
There are so many, thousands of them apparently. Well, I, even the hundreds I have, I haven't read all of them. Two families of objects. Um, Cogito Interruptus <laughs> in praise of St. Thomas. Okay, you can sum up um, his, yeah, anyway, there you go. So, uh, Travels in Hyperreality, it's brilliant. Okay, and we're coming down to the end here. I've got a few more to go. On the shoulders of giants are, um, this is not, these are not essays. These are, this is a, oh, it's a collection of essays. Well, there you go. <laughs> I don't think I've read this one yet either. On the shoulders of giants. Um, yeah, I'm running out of time here. I really need to finish this up. Okay, um, Kant and the Platypus, essays on language and cognition. I read some of them. These ones are a little tough for me. Um, I love the titles of everything. Just so wonderful. So I think I'm going to be having, maybe I'm, maybe maybe next year is going to be an Umberto Eco essay year. Okay, this one I never have a problem with reading. How to Travel with the Salmon on Other Essays is hilarious. Uh, it should have been on my, 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 these are a few of my favorite things, but I mentioned even then when I was doing that video that it was way too long and I had way too many things and I'd already been talking for an hour almost and that I was done with that, but that there were plenty of other titles on my shelves that qualified as comfort reading. And this is one of them. Uh, I, I did um, include it, oh, I included it in the introduction to my library probably. This is, this is one which I've had for a long time. I've reread many times. How to travel with a salmon, how to replace a driver's license, how to eat in flight. Oh dear, this is really good. How to go through customs, how to travel on American trains, how to take intelligent vacations. These are hilarious. Every single one of them. These are great. Pointed, he's got he's got a you know, he's got some some pointed bits to stick in you, but these are really, really, really funny. How to travel with a salmon is the best. You're gonna love it have it get it read it it's wonderful okay serendipities language and lunacy now this is another set of essays literary essays uh with oh the pictures <laughs> yeah with like yeah there you go the tower of babel right so um intellectual history by the author of the name of the rose it, serendipities illuminates the ways in which people have projected the familiar onto the strange throughout history to make sense of the world from Leibniz's belief that the I Ching illustrated the principles of calculus to Marco Polo's mistaking a rhinoceros for a unicorn. Uh, layers of mistakes that have shaped human history are uncovered with wit, erudition, and astonishing clarity. Yeah, there is the man. Um, okay. Six Walks in the Fictional Woods. This is the one that actually had the huge essay on Sylvie, which I then needed to find. It took me three years to find it, but I finally did. Um, and this was this was excellent. It was uh, was looking at what was going on in Sylvie, which is you think read it, think this is kind of like a silly thing, but um, but actually it is. Uh, it was the work of a author who committed suicide. And Umberto Eco shows you why why that was important, and and various and and, and a variety of other things. There you go. There's that, and I have two more to go. One is a very late novel. Was numero zero which I think I read and I didn't, it didn't really, I didn't really kind of like zero, zero in. So I think I probably need to read it again. But there you go. This was, um, this is Mussolini and his mistress are captured and shot by local partisans. The precise circumstances of Il Duce's death remain controversial. 1992 Milan, Colonna, a depressed hack writer, is offered a fee he can't resist to ghost write a book. <laughs> I do read that one because apparently I don't remember it. And then... Yes, the name of the rose. This is the one that has the. Um, this is the one that has the uh, authors. Authors. Uh, has the authors. Uh, uh, postscript. Um, I don't have this in hardback because I this this one much better paperback replaced a very tatty mass market. It made me lazy as I'll get it on um, hardback. But of course, at this stage. The, anything that I really want that's in Harbeck is going to be really expensive because he's, yeah, you know, first edition of it's probably ridiculous. Anyway, yes, I do have The Name of the Rose. And The Name of the Rose was the first book by Umberto Eco that I ever read and realized what a smart guy he was. And the second time I read it, I did it with a notepad in hand and wrote down all the Latin phrases that showed up all from the balne balnearium, balnearium, um, the, the, the bathroom. Um, to the phrases that were just they were they were quotes and I I did find any English words I didn't recognize I looked up but I had a notebook that I was keeping with all of the Latin 
that he introduces in this. This is a detective story. There's a murder. There's a librarian. Um, yeah. I think most of us have read this one. And if we haven't, then we probably don't mean to. But there you go. Name of the Rose. Brilliant. This was his, this was his entry into noveling. And I never looked back. He never stopped writing essays either, though. All right. That is my collection of Umberto Eco in my library. I have a lot. There are 34 books. I've talked about them all. Not quite for an hour. Yay me. <laughs> um, and uh, please enjoy the rest of your evening because I think I might dip away from my TBR for a little bit and read some essays. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Bye-bye.